بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد We're looking at the chapter here where the Shaykh he says Allah the Most Exalted said إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ It is only Satan that suggests to you that you fear his awliya, his supporters and friends from the polytheists and disbelievers. So fear them not but fear me if you are truly believers. Surah Al-Imran, Ayah 175. So Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin, he says, Rahimullah, the connection of this chapter with the previous one is that the author, Rahimullah, followed the chapter on love with the one about fear because worship is centered on two things, love, mahabba, and fear, khawf. And so we know this is important when it comes to ibadah. That we have in total three things, <clears throat> and two of them are here, love and fear, and the third one being hope. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of love Along with our fear for Him And the punishment of Allah And the hope for Allah's reward And in His paradise <clears throat> So through love orders are carried out And with the aid of fear abstinence from prohibition is established Even though the abstaining servant Seeks nearness to Allah therefrom However this is from the requirements of abstaining from Prohibitions And it's not, and not its basis if you were to ask a person who does not commit fornication, why? He would answer that out of fear of Allah. And if you ask someone who observes prayer, he will reply hoping Allah's reward and His love. Each of them complements the other. <clears throat> the fearing and the obedient both desire salvation from Allah's punishment and attainment of His favor. Is it not then better for a person to give preponderance to the aspects of fear or that of hope, they are different regarding that. Some say it's necessary to give priority to the aspects of fear, so it makes him abstain from sins, and then he acts upon good deeds. Others say he should give priority to aspects of hope, so he's optimistic. The Messenger وسلم, really liked optimism. We covered that before. يحب الفعل Rasul used to love the good omen. And some also say regarding good deeds, hope should be given priority. Whoever is favored to do good deeds will have the privilege of acceptance. Thus, one of the pious predecessors, he said, If Allah favors you to supplicate, then you should expect acceptance. Because Allah said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, Invoke me, I will respond to your invocation. Surah Ghafir, Ayah 60. And with respect to falling to sins, the aspect of fear is given. Priority, so that it prevents him from it. And when he fears the punishment, he repents. And this is the most correct thing. However, it is not the most perfect thing because Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ مَجِرَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِنَا رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ And those who give their charity which they give and their hearts are full of fear because they are sure to return to the Lord. That is, they fear that not be, may not be accepted from them. However, it comes in the Hadith of Qudusi, Allah the Almighty, the Sublime said, I am to my servant as he thinks of me and I am with him when he remembers me. So here the shaykh is discussing the instances of hope in Allah and the fear of Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some argue in favor of having fear, and others having more hope, and others saying even coming to worship or acts of ibadat, you have hope. And when it comes to certain uh, sins, prohibitions, you have fear. In reality, we combine between them all. We must have hope and fear of Allah. And we love Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do worship out of love. And the best example we see is Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he used to supplicate in the prayer and outside of it, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah wa na'udhu bika min al-nar. Here we combine with you hope and fear. Oh Allah, I ask for you, paradise. That's the hope from Allah. Wa na'udhu bika min al-nar. And I seek refuge in you from the hellfire. That's the, the fear of Allah. So in reality, we combine between them. Oh Allah, I ask you for paradise. Hope and fear. Here is hope and love. And then of course the other part was the fear. So we combine between them. So the Shaykh Ibn Uthim is discussing different ways that it can be approached. But nonetheless, Ahl-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, they combine between all three. 
as people of innovation, as we covered before, they have extremes on either end. So the group known as the Khawarij, the Kharajites, a rebellious group, they have too much fear of Allah and no hope, such that they remove people from out of the fold of Islam if they don't have the prerequisite fear and they fall into the major sins. Another group, the Murjia, the group that has a lot of hope, such that they will commit the major sins and they say, Allah Ghafur Rahim, Allah will forgive us, and they don't come with the necessary fear. So, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we balance between these and we come with all of them. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hope in Him, and loving Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Shaykh mentioned Imam Ahmed saying, Rahimahullah, it is necessary that his fear and hope are equal. Either of them dominates, destroys the individual. This is to say, he will make them like two wings of a bird. When the two wings are not equal, in the bird he falls. It's a very good analogy. Some they mention love in the middle, it means the, the head of it is love, and the wings are the hope and the fear. So this is a good way to, to, to understand how we should uh, approach the fear and the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khawf al raja And so this chapter is about khawf, because the last chapter was about mahabba, and how we understand it. And the Shaykh is going to get into now the taqsimat, or the aqsam, or khawf. We said in last week's lesson there are types of love, so this Shaykh will look at the types of fear. So Shaykh, he begins mentioning, after he mentions this discussion, that Fear has its forms. The first of them is fear and relate, relating to worship, surrendering, revering, a, a, a submission. As some refer to it as the, the fear, the secret fear, khawf sir So this is in relation to surrendering and worship, ibadah, and tadallul, and khudur. And this only belongs to Allah. If someone wants to give it to other than Allah, i.e. fear someone of the creation, whether it be the dead, or the idols, or the jinn, or the um, different saints, awliyat, the people they have, then this type of fear that they, they're, they're having towards these things are, is shirk. Because this type of fear only belongs to Allah. So this type of fear, khawf al-sir, he says, referred to as, belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important that we don't fear the creation that to this level, and to this ability, to this type of, of, of fear. The second type is the khawf al tabi'i, the natural, innate, instinctive fear. And basically, it's allowed according to the statement of Allah about Musa, فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفًا يتلقب. So Musa, alayhi salam, and he escaped from them, means Fir'aun's people, خَائِفًا يتلقب. He was fearing them, instead of fear and looking about. Because when Musa Aysam accidentally killed the man from the Coptics, and other man informed him, Fir'aun will take vengeance. Means he will take a punishment for him, or punish him for that, he fled. Khaif and fearing. So this is permissible to fear because he will be harmed. Another example, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي قَتَلْتُ مِنْهُمْ نَفْسًا فَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَقْتُلُوا Another instance in the Quran, Musa says, he said, My Lord, I have killed a man among them. And I fear that they will kill me. So the Qas is ayah 33. It's khawf al-tabi'i, it's natural. Someone threatens you, or you're fearing for physical harm, or from animals that are supposed to be feared from, like being afraid of lions and snakes. This is something that's permissible. It's human nature to have this type of fear. And we also know when Musa a.s. was showing the magicians the truth and showing them the signs of Allah, when they threw their sticks or their ropes and they became into snakes, Musa became fearful of that. Allah says to Musa, don't be afraid. Today you will be the one who is triumphant. So that's natural to fear these things. And human beings, we flee them. We fear and we flee against from that which we fear from. And then he mentions, um, the only Sheikh mentions here two categories, but in the other explanations he mentions more. So, for example, Thalatha al usur is Sharh Abidim Athim, he mentions three categories. In reality, the ulama say there are actually four. If you were to count them all, and perhaps we mention all four of them, that way it becomes easier because Shaykh mentions only two here. So, the first one we mention here is the Khawf al Sir, the, the fear that is only belonging to Allah, not to the idols and awliya. And this belongs to Allah, we have to fear Him. And to fear other than Him the way we're supposed to fear Allah, that's the shirk. Allah says, 
Yet they try to frighten you with those who are underneath or beside Allah. Surah Zumar, Ayah 36. So this is not the way the believers should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humiliation and worship and submission only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that fear obviously produces someone to stay from the sins and stay from the haram. The second one is fear by leaving off what is obligatory. So it's a type of fear someone has which leads to leaving off tarq al ibajabat khawfam min nas fearing the people. And that's not permissible in Islam. This is important. You can't fear the people since that we leave off a wajib. And there's a hadith sahih, Hassan hadith actually, in Majid Ahmed report. Yawm al qiyam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the server, Ma mana'aka ila ra'ayta munkar? What prevented you when you saw an evil? And tunkiruhu, that, you, you, that stopped you from detesting it. So, Vida laqana, laqina Allah abdan bi hujjatihi. Ya hujjatuhu qal, ya rabb. رَجَوْتَكْ وَفَرِقْتُ مِنَ الناس. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He gives mankind a chance to uh, respond, to give an answer, He'll say, Allah, I hoped in You, in Your mercy, and I was afraid of the people. وَفَرِقْتُ مِنَ الناس. So here we see that this is not allowed. Allah will hold accountable to the servant for that. Of course, it doesn't mean that every time there is an evil that we have to detest it if there is some harm, immediate harm. So the ulama, when they talk about it, talk about their ex- exemptions to this. For example, if you order the good, you will be beaten. Uh, you know it, or you'll be uh, executed, or you'll be jailed. But you, then that one, you don't have kudra. We have ability to do as we're supposed to. We know we're supposed to take charge. We try to detest it with our hand. If we can't do it with our tongue, or if we can't do it with our heart. So this type of fear is dangerous. And likewise, it doesn't have to always be changing with our hand. There could be other hadith mentioned even with speaking up against it, advising people in relation to it, warning against it. As the Messenger of Allah said, لا يمنعنا حدكم حيبة الناس Don't let the, the, the awe or the fear of other people prevent you. And يقول الحق إذا رآهم أو شهده أو علمه To say the truth if he sees it, or he knows it, or he or witnesses it. So we're not supposed to have fear to people such that we leave off an obligation. Likewise, for example, someone needs to pray, salat time comes in. And we're not in the masjid, we're not in the place where we have to pray. We have to pray, we have to pray. And so we know, we have to pray, we have to pray where we are. Even if we're not able to reach the masjid, we have to pray salat. We can't say, oh, well, the people will see me and they will think I'm this or that. If we have no option but to pray, salat time comes in and we know we have to pray this time. Especially in the situation where someone cannot lead, get himself to the jama'ah or to the masjid. So this is something we have to be careful of. We don't leave the salah and say, oh, I'll just pray later. That's something we find to find. But out of fear that the people will see them or they'll say, I can't pray at work for the boss will say this. This is an obligation. We should not fear the people and the obligation of Allah. Third is the natural fear which we discussed. The fourth one is the one that has a fear of ibadah. Khawf, that's ibadah. The servant he has, every time he increases in this type of fear that he will increase in his Adherence to the obligations and stay of their prohibitions. So we are four altogether. And so fear, obviously, Sheikh says, the connection between the fear and Tawheed is that the aspect of fear is that which joining partners to Allah conducts Tawheed. So the reality is the khawf of sir belongs to Allah. If you give it out in Allah, it's shirk. That's why it's here. And Allah mentioned, and this is the Sheikh's Dreen, in the Madarik Mushaytan Yukhawi Fawliyahu. It is only shaitan that he suggests you fear his awliya. So here the shaykh is talking about, uh, starts to explain that the word here, innama, it's, it's restrictive. Adal hasar is a restrictive syntax, again referring to the threat of the idolaters, to the idol worshippers. And so he says here then, it may also be that the word shaitan is adjective. So shaykh explains how different ways you can interpret this. And it says that refers to the helpers who aid shameless deeds and ignore practices because shaitan orders them. Thus, everyone who aids shameful deeds and ignore practices amongst the awliya of shaitan. And then he says also this could be in respect to shirk and the things that contradict tawheed, it would be great. And maybe things lesser than that. This is suggested you fear his awliya. So shaitan, he tries to. Get the believer to be afraid of his awliya, his supporters. 
Ramal says in, the, in, in order, Do not fear them, rather fear me. And so it's a benefit then that a person, if he increases in his fear of Allah, he will remove from himself the fear of these things. Maybe when Qayyim Muhammad mentions that when the servant he increases in the fear of Allah, he will remove Zara minhu, he will remove from his heart Khawfum min qalbihi, from the Khawf in his heart from these awliya. And so in reality, the opposite is true. If someone's fear in Allah is weak, then they become more increasingly in fear of these idols. And we know that they frighten the people with it. It means if we don't submit or give uh, uh, sacrifice to our idols, they will harm you. Or the awliya will punish you. Or the idol will curse you. And we see in the Quran that they used to threaten the prophets and messengers with these things. And in reality, they do those things that they're trying to threaten them by, don't have any fear in reality. No real ability to harm anyways. So in Natsu, Shaykh said, the shaitan frightens everyone who intends to carry out an obligation. And so when shaitan casts fear into your heart, it is obligatory upon you that you know that going ahead upon the truth does not reduce lifespan, nor does it neither does silence and cowardice increase lifespan. How many are those who are callers to Islam who upheld the truth and died on their beds? And how many were cowards who were killed in their homes? Consider Khalid Murid, radiallahu ta'ala, who was brave, was a vanguard, but he died on his bed. As long as the person upholds Allah's orders, he should be certain Allah is the one who, whose fear, uh, Allah is with, uh, they're certain that Allah is with those who fear Him, and do not and do good deeds. And this is a great example of Khalid Muri. If you look at his biography, Allah Taala, how many battles he participated before Islam, during Islam, and after Islam. Yet he died a natural death. He intended to, and he desired to wish to die a shaheed, but. Allah decreed that he was successful in all these battles. To study the millionaire from him that he was not uh, unsuccessful in any battle. Before or after Islam. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we know others who, Shaykh said, they die cowards in their own homes. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees death from wills. Walau kuntu fi buruj musayyada. Even if we were to hide in ta- lofty towers of, of, of great strength, death will come to, him, come to us, Allah decreed. So we should not be afraid of what shaitan he puts fear in us. For example, poverty. Shaitan, he used poverty as one way to fear the awliya and the, uh, the believers. So that you fear that if you do these khayrat, you will become poor, you won't get this job, you won't get this career, you won't become like this, so you get scared. Or he fears them physical punishment or from other things. And so we have to, we should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the shaykh says, so fear them not, means it's prohibitory. And undoubtedly the prohibition here shows forbiddance. Rather, we should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in kuntum mu'mineen. So if we are truly believers. And so we also benefit from another thing that someone should not have unnecessary fear. Uh, there's some fear that is cowardice. Or, and we're not supposed to be this way, we're cowards. And Islamically, we're not supposed to be that, that way. So even though there is natural fear, there's no fear in that which is not supposed to be feared. For example, someone fears a shadow or he fears something that is um, not harmful. This is a type of weakness. So the ulama also mentioned that kind of fear is blameworthy. So some of the fear we mentioned here are Mahmud, praiseworthy, some are Badmoon, just praiseworthy, some are not prohibited, and some are unnecessary. As a benefit as well, Ibn Qayyim, Rahmanullah, when discussing the word khawf, what he says, khawf wa haraka, he said the khawf is a haraka, it's a movement, il qalb, il hurub min makruh. Definition of the word khawf, he said al khawf wa huwa al haraka. Khawf, he says, is a movement, il qalb. It's a movement of the heart or an action of the heart. To escape that which is disliked. And he mentions in Madara Jasadakin, volume 1, page 5, 12 to 513. Al Khawf, who is a haraka, in the Qalbi, in the Hurubi, in the Makruh. What's the difference between Khawf and Khashya then? Because we know Khashya is what we're supposed to obtain as well. He says, Khashya obviously is higher. Khashya, he says, is a fear accompanied with knowledge and ma'rifah. Bi'ilm wa ma'rifah. Khashya comes with knowledge and understanding and, 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 and possessing this knowledge. And that's why Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَأَنَا أَعْلَمُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَأَشَدُّهُمْ لَهُ خَشْيَةً That I am the one who fears and knows most about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than them. And I am more knowledgeable Allah, about Allah than them. وَأَشَدُّهُمْ لَهُ خَشْيَةً and I have most severe or more intense khashya than them. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ 
So when Allah, when the ulama mentioned this ayah, verily the one is the ulama who fear Allah. Why? Because they have ilm. So that's why khafi bi ilm. Or it's khawf, it doesn't have necessarily the ilm. And also, this hadith is Muslim. Man a'lamuhum billahi wa ashadduhum lahu khafiya. And then Muqayyim mentioned the nice benefits is for khawf, for the amat al-mu'mineen. Khawf is for the general, generally for the believers. Where khashiyah to the ulama al-arifin. Whereas khashiyah belongs to the ulama who are arifin, those who are knowledgeable and who know. So that's a nice way to distinguish, despite the fact that we're supposed to still try to seek and to gain khashiyah. And so we type in ibadah. We're supposed to seek and try to obtain it, but we see a difference between the two. One is higher than the other. And then Shaykh Islam brings another ayah. وَإِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَيَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتِ الزَّكَاةَ وَلَمْ يَخْشَى إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَعَسَى أُولَيْكَ يُكُونُ مِنَ الْمُحْتَدِينَ The mosques of Allah should be maintained only by those who believe in Allah and the last day offer prayers perfectly and give zakat and fear none but Allah. It is they who are expected to be on a true guidance. So the benefit here, وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ So we see now, the benefit of Imara, maintain the masajid of Allah. And for who is that responsibility? And Shaykh says here, the maintenance here is not hissi, it's ma'anawi. It's figurative, it's not literal. It means praying in there and doing dhikrullah and reading Quran. Likewise, the physical maintenance is also there, constructing it. So the Quraysh should not be fitting for them when shahidin ala anfusim bil kufr, they already witnessed kufr on themselves, not befitting that they be administering the masjid, masajid. But administrating and maintaining the masajid, both physically building it, but also allow it, establishing or allowing the prayer to be established in the dhikr of Allah and the Quran, it's a noble deed. And it belongs to those who fear only Allah. That's the shahid. Walam yakhsha illa Allah. Shaykh says, What does it mean those who believe in Allah? Aminu. So, Imam Billah has four things you have to have. When we say, and to amana billah, you have to believe in Allah, it means four things. Number one, belief in his existence. So iman bi wujudi, you have to believe Allah exists. And unfortunately, in our today's time, we have a group of people who don't believe Allah exists. It's a minority in the past and present who don't believe Allah's existence, despite the number of proof and evidences. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul fi Allah shak. Say, is there doubt in Allah? It means the only way proof is in the one who says Allah doesn't exist to bring proof that Allah doesn't exist. Because it's already default and proven both by the aql and the hiss by our faculties or our senses and by number of proofs Allah exists so we have to believe in existence belief in his lordship the rububiyyati belief that Allah is only deserves worship so in ibadah and lastly be asma'ahi wa sifati so basically the three tawheeds and along with that the fact that Allah exists wujub and wujud some other man mentioned the obligation of Allah's existence and especially in today's time it's a must that we Emphasize that for the doubts that will have arisen about Allah's existence from those who are disbelievers. The last day is the day of resurrection, is also called this because there's no day after that. After the day of Qiyamah, the day of the last day, the day of the last day, the day of the last day, a party will be in paradise, a party in hellfire. Shaykh Salam Taymiyyah says, Rahimahullah, Allah, often all what the Prophet said are included in the belief in Allah on the last day. What will happen after death, such as trial in the grave, punishment and enjoyment. This is because the real thing is that when a person dies, his resurrection commences and has moved to the home of the recompense. So in reality, when we say Yom Al-Akhir, it includes belief in everything that comes after death. Whatever comes back to mouth. From Adab Al-Qabr, and also its punishment. When someone passes away, his Qiyamah established. So there's two types of Qiyamah. And then the major one, and then the moment when someone passed away, Qiyam Qiyamatuhu. His Qiyamas are started as he moves to the grave. So Allah often connects belief in him with the belief in the last day because all belief in the last day leads to obedience. If he believes that there is resurrection and recompense, that makes him work towards that day. So it's a way to, to motivate the believer to be in obedience of Allah to remember Yom Al Qiyam. And establishing the prayer in a perfect manner. Prayer is obviously an obligatory one, and there is one that's virtuous. And give them the zakat, these are what the believers they do. And they also fear none by Allah, and that's the shahid. He said, khashya, reverence, but giving above us fear. So it's above fear, khashya, as we mentioned. It's a kind of khawf, 
but more restricted. And the fear difference between the two, she actually says two things. Chashiyah comes with knowledge, but the word means the one who you have a chashiyah for. So in this case, Allah, إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء إن الله عزيز غفور It's only those who have knowledge among his slaves that fear him, or fear Allah. As for khawf, maybe for the ignorant person may have khawf. Also, khashiyah comes due to mightiness of the revered, because unlike khawf, maybe due to the weak, weakness of the fearing individual, whereas khashiyah comes with the greatness. So he comes with greatness and azamah. Allah says, فَلَا تَخْشَوْ فَلَا تَخْشَوْ النَّاسَ وَخْشَوْ Therefore, fear not men, but fear me. And the benefit of the Rasul ﷺ said, and you should know that if people were to gather to benefit you with anything, they cannot benefit you except by that which Allah has written for you. And if they gather to harm you with anything, they cannot harm you except with that which Allah has written for you. Hayat of Muslim Ahmed and others, the Hadith Sahih. It's actually the Hadith Muslim too, but this is a different wording. And then he brings the next verse, Allah says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ And of mankind are some who say we believe in Allah. فَإِذَا أُوْدِيَ فِي اللَّهِ جَعَلَ فِتْنَةَ النَّاسِ كَعَذَابِ اللَّهِ We believe in Allah, but if they were made to suffer for the sake of Allah, they consider the trial of mankind as Allah's punishment. كَعَذَابِ اللَّهِ so here, the point the Shaykh, the Shaykh is trying to draw from this, why are these people, when Allah subhanahu wa tests them, and Allah tests the believers, this is very important, when someone believes, Allah will test them. Allah says, does mankind think that we will leave them to say, I believe, and not be tested? So verily, we'll be tested. So when they are tested, these type of people, they make the fitn, they make the, Test here, ka'adab Allah. The Shaykh says, see what is intended here is that because the faith in Allah and establishing his religion, it's also allowed for the meaning to be that they suffer in regards to Allah's laws. So there's a great benefit here that they, instead of interpreting this to be a test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, see it to be adab Allah. So here, Shaykh says, well, no, that mankind will avoid the punishment of Allah, so follow his order. This person who makes their people's trial. Like Allah's punishment and so runs away from their trials to conform to their desires and orders making the and orders making the trials like punishment. In that case he would fear the people as he should fear Allah because he made their afflicting him like Allah's punishment and abandoned it uh, to concur with their orders. So the reason why he flees and why he runs and thinks of the fitna of the people is like the punishment of Allah is because he's scared of being tried. And then he moves to his desires of fearing the people and going to that which they are upon. Away from that which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to be upon. Because we know when you stand Allah's orders and establish them, Allah will test you. But if you're fearing the people or fearing this and want to follow your desires, you don't fear Allah rather you're fearing the people. And so Shaykh says has great benefits. Number one, when Allah himself decrees for his servant, because Allah says, Abdullah ala harf. Some people they worship Allah upon edge. In a if they are given good or befalls them, they're content. But if a child befalls them, they turn their face. So this is not how the believers should be. Well Allah says, gave God tidings to the patient, that those who are afflicted with calamity, when calamity afflict them to say truly to Allah we belong and truly to Him we shall return. Number two, while Allah decrees through the hands of His creatures as a harm, tests and trials such as the verse cited above. So when some of the people are afflicted with their trials, they will not persevere, they will even disbelieve and apostate. And sometimes they disbelieve by conjuring the orders of Allah, and they are standing during the trial. Many others have faith reduced to extremely bad levels due to the trials. Therefore a Muslim should be careful, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries His servants, who will make His faith clear. وَنَبْنُوَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى نَعْلَمُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَنَبْلُوا أَخْبَارَكُمْ Allah says, Surely we shall trial you and test you till we test those who strive hard in the patient months and we shall test, we shall test your facts. 
to see those who are liars and those who are truthful. So when tests arise, when the, we should be firm upon that which Allah has commanded. Not fleeing to the desires of the people and ourselves. And so these people, they lack the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is necessary. And in fact, they give that fear to the people. And so we see also see a reality of some people is that during fitna, people, they become clear who is upon what. This is where in fitna they fell. And so here again emphasizing that we have to have the proper fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if we're being trial and tested. And that's the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test His servants. As it comes to the hadith, Allah loves the people, He trials them and tests them. The next hadith that comes is actually a weak hadith. But the one that comes after it is quite uh, important. And this one that here is Hadith Abu Sa'id, but it's actually a Daif hadith. So in fact, we'll move to the next one, which is Hadith Aisha, where it says that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, Whoever seeks Allah's pleasure, at the cost of people's displeasure, Allah will be pleased with him and make the people be, be pleased with him. But whoever seeks the people's pleasure at the cost of Allah's pleasure, displeasure, Allah will be angry with him and make the people be angry with him. The report of Ibn Hibban and his Sahih. This hadith, the ulama, they differ if it's marfu or mawquf. And some they said that in reality it's mawquf. This hadith is mawquf. It stops the Aisha and it's sahih. So Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu wrote to Aisha to give him some advice and make it to make it summarize. So she wrote to him this advice. And so this narration is important. We see that, again, we should be in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking Allah's pleasure, fearing Him. Only, not the people. But as we mentioned in the verse earlier, but I talk about nas. We should not fear the people. Nakhshon. So here, whoever seeks Allah's pleasure, man al-tamas arid Allah. Whoever seeks Allah's pleasure, bi sakhat nas with the displeasure of the people, radi Allah wa anhum ardo wa arda anhu nas. That the people, Allah will be pleased with him, and the people will be pleased with them. So here, the Sheikh says here. That it means the pleasure of Allah expresses this here. After Sheikh mentions this, he says, This is obvious. If the servant seeks the pleasure of his Lord, sincerely Allah will be pleased with him because he's more bountiful than his servant and he will make the people be pleased with him owing to the love and pleasure for him. They will cast in the heart since the hearts are between the two fingers. He turns them as he wills. So it's a great benefit here that we should, if we seek Allah's pleasure, Allah will be pleased with us and the people as well. This is very important because a lot of people are worried about that. People will not be pleased with me if I follow the sunnah openly. If I practice my Islam, I dress like a Muslim, I do the ibadah, people will think bad at me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the people beloved to them. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Allah said, those who believe in your good deeds, سَيَجَعَلُ لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَانُ وُدَّ Allah will make the people, the creation love Him, and place the love, the wood for the people, uh, the creation for, for Him. And so, but the opposite is not true, or is true, that if the people, you seek the people's pleasure, whoever seeks the people's pleasure, by Allah's displeasure, by displeasing Allah, and she says the opposite is the intent here, Allah will be displeased with him, and have wrath or anger, or anger upon him. And the people will also likewise be angry, and displeased with him. Therefore, he, should, he will put dislike and abhorrence for him in the hearts. So what's the relevance between this chapter and this hadith, or this narration? Sheikh says a number of things. That one of them, out of the fear of them, means the people who are seeking people's pleasure and not Allah's, they have a fear of him, of the people. They're fearing the people. So that they may be pleased with them. Thus, he's giving preference of them over Allah. This is a very, very important narration because today's time, this is what we have to ask ourselves. Are we pleasing the people or pleasing Allah? Trust me, we know the rules of the religion of what we can and cannot do or what is haram, what's haram, what's sunnah, are we pleasing the people? And if someone does this, instead of pleasing Allah, both Allah and the people will not be pleased. And we see this. And perhaps you may say, I will do this for the people so the people may think better of me or to be away from any criticism and then people still criticize you. And so we are that person has failed. Because whoever Allah is pleased with, then he's obtained the success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with those who follow the path of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahab. 
وعد لهم جنات تجري تحت الأنهار خالدين فيها بدا. is prepared for them paradise and under which rivers flow, which they abide therein forever. So we benefit a number of things from this hadith. Number one, the obligation of seeking Allah's pleasure, even the people are displeased, since it's Allah that truly benefits the harms. This is important. This is in all spheres of life, whether it be at home, whether it be with our friends, whether it be with, uh, with our work and our school. Always about Allah's pleasure first. And Allah will aid us. His obligation. Allah Akbar. Allah's pleasure is Akbar, the greatest. Number two, it is not allowed to seek what displeases Allah in order to please the people, no matter the person. And this is important. We covered last week how much we have to love Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Over his, his children, his parents, So if our parents are giving us a hard time regarding religion, we have to hold fast to that which Allah will do it to us. With patience, and with sabr, with yaqeen. Allah will make it very easy, sooner or later. So we see here that we should not try to please the people in displeasing Allah. There is no obedience to the makhluk in ma'asiyyat al-khaliq. So whether it be in a professional setting or a school setting, we should not go for that which is halal. Uh, haram, afwan. We should not go for that which is haram. See, well, it's everybody's doing it. Or it's easier. Or everyone will be okay with me. No. If Allah is displeased with you, your ultimate goal of success will not be given to you. Ma tawfiqi la billah. Tawfiq is success only belongs to Allah. It's only with Allah, right? So even if you say, I will do what everyone else is not doing, be doing the right thing, it's more challenging, but Allah will give you the success you're attaining. Whereas the people who are doing the haram things, who think they're getting away, Allah will expose them tomorrow, later, sooner or later. And they will not obtain that which they wish. It's very important. We should not believe that people who are doing wrong, they're obtaining anything. Whatever good obtained in the dunya now is qaleen, and then the punishment, the questioning is severe. Number three, affirmation of the attributes of pleasure and anger for Allah. So Allah has the attribute of anger and pleasure. But haqiqah, in reality, we don't compare this to the creation of the Committee of Shaykh Muslim and Nasir. And this is the position of Harasun al Jama'ah, as we've covered this, these, this, this topic before, of Asma wa Sifat. As for those who are rejectionists, those who deny the names and attributes of Allah, they deny it, its reality and say because anger is the rise in the heart's blood to seek vengeance, and this is not appropriate for Allah. And this is error because they infer Allah's displeasure or anger from the anger of the creation. So we should we refute them with two things, preclusion and criticism. They have to, we preclude that the meaning of the anger described to Allah, the Almighty, is like the anger of the creation. And this is haram to do that. And secondly, the criticism, which is that we will say to the Asha'ira, because they're the group that are saying this, you have established a wish for Allah, the Almighty, the, ex- the Exalted, and a will, which is the heart's inclination towards getting benefit and putting away harm. And that is not appropriate for your Lord. If the answer that the wish is created, we say the anger you have described is that of the creature. Whoever rejects the apparent meaning of the text using intellectual inferences, in reality, this is astray. And it goes in different ways of refuting them, which I think these were covered in other lessons. So Allah has these attributes in reality. So we don't make them see likening or taqif, asking about the how, but we don't know. And we don't establish... Examples for Allah. We should not put forward similitudes for Allah and say that Allah's anger like our anger. And we also know amongst the creation, not all anger is dispraised. Sometimes anger in the, amongst the creation is praiseworthy. For example, if someone criticizes Islam and the religion, we have to be angry for that. For Allah's sake. And we know the story of Musa a.s. who got angry when his people were the Russian idols. And he threw down the alwah, the the. the, the uh, tablet or the uh, piece uh, of wood where the Torah was written, he threw it down. And Musa Then he picked it up when his anger subsided. It means he was angry for Allah's sake. They were doing major sin, shirk. So this not all the the way that people they assume the analogy by saying that anger is dispersing human beings. Some anger is allowed, and other anger isn't. But for Allah, of course, we don't have established like this. We don't establish examples and amthar. And we don't try to ration. Allah SWT says he gets angry. Allah SWT says, please, we accept it. It's a salim. And we also know, يليق بجلاله in a matter befitting his majesty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really the end of this chapter it comes to this point where the shaykh again emphasizing the importance of fear and the proper fear that we should have. In relation to Allah, and of course, the different types of fear that exist. 
So a person should have fear of Allah as much as he has love for Him, as you mentioned last week's lesson. And we should not be fearing the idol worshippers, or the idols, or the awliya, or those in the grave. And we should not be people who also are turning away from establishing the commandments of Allah out of fear of something, fear of the punishment of the people. For the true believers, they establish the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they are much more for those who fear Allah. وَلِمَنْ خَافُ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ Allah says, for those who fear the Lord, they have two jannahs, two, two places, two uh, paradises. And Allah says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ The one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he stays away from ma'naha, that which Allah has prohibited. For in the jannah to hear ma'wa. Jannah for him is about. So fearing Allah is much a benefit. And this is something that we should also try to grow within ourselves. That we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we fear him. And be wary of him. And always know that he's watching us subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also benefit here that just like there are aqsam, there are types of muhabba, there are types of fear. So we should not be fearing the people the way we fear Allah. And we shouldn't be fearing the people, the creation, more than we fear Allah. And we have to assess ourselves, how are we regarding the fear of Allah? And are regarding the pleasure of Allah. It should be in the forefront of our mind, always to please Allah. No matter who is angry with us or displeased with us. For reality, if you also look at the experience of people, and the people before us in history, we see that no matter what difficulty people may have, due to establishing the haqq, those who they were afraid of or who had harm from them, eventually the harm that they have disappeared. Either by them disappearing, or that harm itself not being long. Allah started right removing it. And so when we are to the true winners and people who are successful, those who establish the rules of Allah despite the challenges. Whereas if we're only practicing our faith or establishing our faith when things are easy, then that is not true sincere, right? It's not a true and sincere love and fear of Allah. For who will not establish the truth when it's easy? It's rather a difficulty that someone uh, is really tested and really see where they stand. So this is in summary. Uh, inshallah, if anyone has any uh, questions or something to add. Can you uh, tell us some of the ways uh, where we can attain or increase in the fear that helps us stay away from sin? That which really helps someone to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have uh, avoidance of the sins is to have knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His names and attributes, to be wary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi, and you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al And the Rabbi Akhlabim Rasad. Allah is overwatching me, monitoring us. We have knowledge of Allah's punishment as well as His reward. You are more likely, due to this knowledge, to have that fear. And to have again, to obtain, try to obtain the khashya. And also a person should be wary of that. When he's alone or when they are away from those people who are uh, upright. Means they're with family or with this by themselves. That they fear that no one is watching them. They have to be aware, they have to build into that knowledge. The muraqa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there. Also, a person should cut himself off from those means that lead to haram. So asbab and asalib that lead to haram, he has to cut himself from it. So along with increasing the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes, and also increasing knowledge in general of Allah, and about the akhirah, about jannah and jahannam, puts person in the yaqeen, because then he will have ihsan. And he will know, whenever I do, Allah will ask him. Then he will be wary of the haram. Because it's not you do haram and that's it. Allah will ask you. Allah will punish you if you wish. Then you become more afraid because it's real. Whereas someone whose iman is weak will say, Yes, Allah will punish me, Allah can forgive me. So increasing our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes, and also our knowledge about Allah in general, is the sharia. But also cutting off the means of evil. So if it's a particular place or particular tools, or take, we have to cut ourselves off from those things. Because it's obviously easier for someone to do haram is a bill. You have to cut them off. So, and we have to also be aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's always watching us. And so somebody, if He says to himself, I will have, for example, if there's something He's tested with watching or playing or whatever it is, something wrong, if it's always accessible to Him, of course, He will be less likely to fear Allah. If it's always there, He may fall into it. But if He removes Himself from it, and accompany himself with the people who are righteous. They will encourage him to increase in his iman and to fear him. So increasing our iman and being on the people of khair.
Those who fear Allah, Ya Yuhri Dinam Tukullah Kunum as Sadiqeen, those who are truthful, those who have hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what they will teach you to be free from Allah as well. And of course, when somebody also should increase in his remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the key to remove someone to protect yourself from sin and disobedience is to always be in the remembrance of Allah. For people in reality, when we sin is because we forget Allah. We allow ourselves to forget Allah and the shaitan will bring to us the haram and the things that are there. And that's why you find yourself when you're in the remembrance of Allah, listening to Quran, reading Quran, making adhkar, listening to lessons, doing khayr, that the sins are less. But you're busy in the remembrance of Allah. And shaitan, he flees. And you're protected from him in his plots. Whereas someone is always away from the remembrance of Allah and the dhikr of Allah, then it's easier to sin. So you should bring yourself in that uh, way to connect these different benefits to protect yourself from sin and if you also it's not to be alone too often and to always be away from the jama'ah al-shaytan ma'al wahid al-hadith shaytan is what one umin ithnayn huwa ba'ad when we two people more he's far further so to be with the righteous company come to the jama'at come to the khair because you see also when you come to explain things your iman and so these are some of the ways to help someone and of course the biggest thing is that he has to increase in his knowledge and fear of Allah is iman when the iman is strong, the sins will become less. You will hate and abhor them. The same Allah describes the believer, the believers of Sahaba that He made for them a karaha ilaykum al kufr wal fusuka wal isya. So we have to make dua to Allah SWT. He makes us people who love and who are beautified and adore for us the good and the good deeds. And people who dislike and they hate the fusuk, the wickedness, rebellion, and sin with Allah SWT. And these are some of the ways, of course, there are other. People who if someone can read and study upon Allah. Can you uh, mention one more time uh, Ibn al Qayyim's definition of uh, uh, fear? He said, Khawf Khawf is the movement or the action of the of that heart, of the, of the, of the heart, lihurub in makroh, to escape or to flee, and that which is disliked. So we doubted the Sarah Key in volume one, page five twelve to five thirteen. Um is fear Allah can it be described in terms of what is felt similar to like emotionally, similar to other types of fear, like of danger. Um so for example, like if you fear for your life, for example, and like the sort of uh, emotional reaction that you have, like, you know, you shake and stuff, is this fear of punishment, does that necess- like necessarily have the same reaction, or can it just be knowing that you'll be punished, and for that reason you stay away, is that still considered fear? Well, obviously the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually inside of the heart. And when we look at the fear of people, yes, it can be manifest in that way where somebody's shaking and crying, and we know that from the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somebody who cries out of the fear of Allah. But it's not necessary that somebody has that same reaction that when you run for your life, you're panicking or you have that reaction, immediate instinct. Because when someone fears, he acts. So it's, a, it's the action, the heart that comes on that top of you, on, onto your body. And you, if you fear Allah, you will not do certain things. And of course, also if you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you may also cry out of the fear of Allah. Because you're, you're, you believe and you're certain about the punishment of Allah. Uh, but we cannot say necessarily that somebody has to be at this level to say that's when they fear Allah, that when they, if they have to cry when they think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in remembrance of Him or read the Quran. This is a higher level. As Sahaba and Salaf, we see ahead of the Rasul, so I said they do cry out of the fear of Allah. And it's easy to cry for them, it's easy for them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also the fact that they fear Allah is the way they avoid the sins. So the days I fear Allah is in the heart, it should lead to that which is important, which is that number one, that you fear in Allah and you have humility, submission to Him inside of yourself. And then it leads you to do the good and prohibits you from doing that wrong. And, and that's why if you go to the kitab Takhweef, uh, Takhweef al-Nar, or the fear of the hellfire by Hafid Mirajib, he talks about this, how the feeling of the hellfire, how can how was it done, how the Sahaba said of, they feared Allah, and what's the different uh, ways that the fear is uh, 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 shown and how it leads to. It's a very good book. Uh, I think it's even in English, the fearing of the hellfire. Uh, behalf of Ibn Rajab rahimahullah talks about in more detail how does someone fear Allah but some of the Sahabi you see them, the fear that they had part of it was uh, that even sometimes they even faint SubhanAllah that when they think when they see the, uh, the fire reflecting again remembering the, 
the severe punishment, how far they would faint. And not to say that that's, that's the only way someone has a fear. This is a poor higher level that someone has that type of fear. But we see that obviously it's something in the heart somebody he, he has and it protects him from this sense. So obviously the, the basic we should, we should find that if we're fearing Allah, we're doing good and we're staying from the haram. Fear is stopping from the prohibitions. True fear. Or as you say, I fear Allah and I'm doing the prohibitions. But that's not, that's not a, a true fear of Allah. Yes. Um, so um, the Prophet he um, he was he will not be punished, right? So how how does he, how did he fear? Um, it, I mean, it probably wasn't a fear of punishment. Still, even with that, the prophets and messengers, despite the fact that they are going to paradise, they still fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you follow the best example of it while they are alive, making dua to Allah to forgive them for their sins, and in Yom Al-Qiyam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come very angry, not never been, so, never been angry like this before, as he describes, all the prophets are worried. Even Jibreel is worried. Everyone is worried. And so we say that that is a true fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises this, he doesn't mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he can do not do whatever he wishes. So it doesn't necessitate say because I know I'm punished now I have served. They still fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah deserves to be feared. And also we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is one who he does whatever he wishes. So despite the Sea of the best example for us, still in the state of fear, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves to be feared, but also again the punishment of Allah is that severe. The same Allah's reward is great. And Sahab likewise, they were guaranteed in Jannah, the ten but they still fear they will go to Jahannam. So again, the fear of Allah is something that was in them, that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planted in them, again, learning it from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it's true fear. And that's what we say, ashaddum khashya. It's not just any fear, it's khashya. They have a knowledge. For they know the reality of Allah's punishment. Whereas for us, you may see that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mana punish us, punish us. We, we are more in need of having true fear. This, right? But the idea is, it is a true fear. This is the true fear they have. And we see that they are fear of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still grant them that. And even the believers, despite the fact that even they are successful in their grave, that they still fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A day that the hair of the children will go gray, it's a severe day. Yom al-Shadid. Right? So this is true fear. So it doesn't say just because they're not punished, they didn't have true fear. I don't know if that's clear, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, we mentioned four of them. So the four of them, we mentioned the of Sir. And then they said the khawf that leaves or leads to leaving off the obligations. Khawf that leads to tarak al wajibat, khawf from the nas, fearing the people. And third, we mentioned khawf al tabi'i, the natural fear. And the fourth word khawf, khawf al ibadah, khawf of ibadah, worship. Some say the khawf al sir. Is like having the fear to other than Allah. Where khawf al ibadah is a true one. Well, those who didn't make it poor, can we say that uh, they made it like subcategories to each other? Mm, they made it too, and then they concluded underneath that. And some they say Mahmud and Madhmum, and then they put the, all of them in there. So essentially, we, this is helpful for us to see that not every fear is bad, and not every fear uh, is good necessarily. So, for example, someone says, Fear Allah. Is something that's very praiseworthy. Uh, we're not supposed to take offense to it. But someone says, "Fear the people," then we say, "This is not befitting." Uh, also, you mentioned about uh, the imbalance, with hope and fear. Yeah. Uh, is that only at the time of dua? In your opinion, I said, for example, I said that in the end, I'll go and cope from the time of dua. Other times, it changes according to the situation. Yeah, Shaykh Rathiri mentioned that. There, there's there's uh, some ulama argue that, yeah, that you can say in certain certain situations it's good to have more hope and, more, and then other situations more fear and other times balance. Or then he says, he, he concludes that the best to balance it. But obviously depending on what that situation which somebody's in, it can also change. Yeah, because for example, someone t- with t- trials and temptation, his fear of Allah should be more so that it prevent him from that. Versus if his hope is more so, he may do the haram and say, Allah will forgive me. So certain situations, there can be a change in the fear and the hope. Can I bother you to repeat that quote about cowards and the cowards and brave ones who may die at times? Yeah, Shaykh mentions here, Ibn Athimim, Rahmanullah, he says, 
that um, how many are they are those who are callers to Islam who upheld the truth and died in their beds? And many were the cowards who were killed in their homes. So how many are those who are callers to Islam who upheld the truth and died in their beds? And how many were the cowards who were killed in their homes? No, for sometimes you may be tested with the sins that you earned. A lot of times they'll test you to see who's about true belief. So sometimes we know we might test with aiding us, that which we earn. A lot of times Allah tests us to test our iman. So, but we should not then lead to that time we are tested that we leave off the orders of Allah, favoring our desires and the people are upon of easiness and wrongdoing. See, that's how we are. For that case, we fear the creation more than Allah. So, but it's true at times. Whatever evil that comes from our own hands. And sometimes we're upon goodness and uprightness. And Allah still tests us. They purify us to increase our darajat. And to grant us that which is only He knows. Of manazil, of stations. So we should always be, whenever it's a situation of test occurred, the question should always be, am I upon the order and the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then you'll be, you know, you'll be successful. If you're upon that, then you succeed. Whereas if the test comes and I fell off from religion, I've fallen away from it. That's what I'm failing the test or I failed it. Or the test comes and instead of attributing it to my wrong doing a wrong, I become angry at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is not the way they believe. Shall we end with this much? Subhanakallah, bihamdika, shadu wa nayyarat, sabrutu wa